Hi and good evening and welcome to the Tenma River Scout Museum presents. We present a program of virtual talks. We've been doing this since COVID started and the museum closed down. We offer these talks free to the public and we're really happy that you're here with us tonight. The Ten Mile River Scout Museum is located at the Ten Mile River Scout Camps Reservation, which is a 12,000 acre reservation in Narrowsburg, New York. The reservation was acquired through a secret process uh, ending in 1927, and it was put together by Franklin Delano Roosevelt and a group of prominent New Yorkers who realized that the Scouts of New York needed a larger area for summer camp. The camp opened to Scouts in 1928. The Ten Mile River Scout Museum was started in 1997, and it's de dedicated to preserving the history and artifacts of the Ten Mile River Scout camps and the local area. As I said, the museum has been closed due to COVID. Uh, that may change this summer, but we haven't gotten word from the, Depart the State Department of Health yet. Nevertheless, you can take a virtual tour of the museum by visiting our website, tmrmuseum.org slash historian. And if you have any questions, you can call us at this number. The webinar tonight is uh, being presented on a platform called GoToWebinar, and somewhere on your screen you'll see a box that looks something like this, and there's an area for questions. So if you have questions for our presenter, please type them here, and at the end of the presentation, we'll try to answer as many as we can. Also, at the end of this presentation, there'll be a brief survey. We appreciate it if you'd stick around and take the survey. And the complete program will be recorded and posted on the museum's YouTube channel in about three days. You can interact with the museum in a, in, in a variety of ways on social media. I mentioned the museum's website. We also have a Facebook page. We're on Twitter. And as I said, we have a YouTube channel where you could also look for the museum's virtual tour. Again, if you have a question, you can call the museum or email the museum at questions at tmrmuseum.org. And if you want to get in touch with me directly, you can get me at chairman at tmrmuseum.org. I don't know, did I introduce myself? I'm Michael Drillinger, and I'm the chairman of the Ten Mile River Scout Museum. Uh, we offer these programs free to the public, but if you really enjoy the program, the museum does incur some expense in putting them together. And if you're so motivated, we would love it if you'd go to tmrmuseum.org slash donate and donate something. Tonight's program is collecting Ten Mile River Scout Camps and OA patches, and it is being presented uh, by one of our trust museum trustees, Mr. Bill Mulrennan. Bill is a longtime patch collector. Bill has or, uh, regularly organizes patch trading traderies, and he's very active on uh, patch trading websites on the web. And it's with great pleasure that I introduce to you, Mr. Bill Morenin. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining this evening. Uh, I'll be presenting um, uh, on uh, collecting 10 mile river scout camps and New York City uh, OA patches. Um, this will just be an overview. Uh, TMR has uh, issued hundreds, if not thousands, of uh, patches, neckerchiefs, earned awards, and other types of memorabilia over the last um, over the last 90 plus years. Uh, previously, the museum had put out a guide to the memorability of Ten Mile River uh, 20 plus years ago, probably now. We're currently in the process of looking to revise that, adding all the new items from the last uh, 20 plus years and uh, correcting any errors and uh, adding a lot of new information. Uh, again, uh, this talk is just going to be a high level overview. Uh, we can only show a small fraction of what has been issued uh, uh, 
over this time period. Um, Excuse me, Bill. Uh, yes. It's, my, it's Michael. Uh, you haven't started your PowerPoint yet. Um, okay. What am I doing wrong? Uh, we have it now? Yes, you, yes, you do. You're good. Yes. Okay, apologies for that. Uh, so again, this is you know a brief introduction and overview of what's been issued. I uh, included images on most of the pages of uh, of samples of various patches that have been issued over the years, but this uh, uh, will only be a small fraction of what was uh, actually done by the camps over the past 90 plus years. Uh, whether you're collecting TMR, Order of the Arrow, or any other area of uh, collecting, uh, it can become a massive undertaking if you want to get everything that was ever issued by every entity. Uh, I'll give you some ideas on how you can, uh, you know, maybe choose a area you're interested in pursuing. Uh, you know, your first accumulation or collection was probably pretty much items that you earned, um, uh, places you attended, events you were at, um, you know, maybe some Order of the Arrow flaps if you're a member of the Order of the Arrow. But becoming more organized and deciding on what you want to collect would be the next step on your patch trading journey. But always remember what you decide to collect remains your decision. You know, you're not restricted on, you know, well, if I don't collect uh, everything from TMR, I don't have a TMR collection. No, you decide what it is you want to collect. Uh, I'll speak a little bit about terminology. I don't want to get hung up too much in it, but as you start collecting, uh, and uh, interfacing with people, you know, through email or over the web. Uh, these are some common terms that have become accepted in patch collecting circles. A lot of them are from order of the arrow collecting, but they do cross um, do cross collecting areas. So let me go over a few of them. Uh, some of the terms or, or codes uh, talk about the uh, shape of the patch. On the right hand of the screen, is an arrowhead patch from Kintakoying Lodge uh, from one of their events a couple of years ago. Uh, jacket patches or back patches are uh, typically six inches, excuse me, six inches or more um, in diameter. Uh, N is typically your NC, the code for neckerchief. Um, and I won't read everyone here on the screen. On the left is an example of a round patch. Uh, those are usually smaller, typically three inches or so. And a rocker is an off-shaped patch or segment, uh, typically worn around a round patch. And TMR has issued uh, several rockers over the years for different purposes. And then some describe the edging on the patch. Uh, some of the more modern uh, laser cut or die cut uh, patches, such as the one on the left, are cut edge. And this is where the uh, stitching doesn't go completely around the border. On the right is a rolled edge patch. Uh, this is where the marrowed border is sewn completely over the patch. So as you, if you look at it with a sideways view, uh, you will see uh, this, the thread goes totally around the patch and does not, uh, does not expose the side of, of the patch. And lastly, piping. And that's the ribbon-like border that you see uh, on neckerchiefs. And the image here, you'll see this black piping on this orange uh, 10 mile river neckerchief. There are just a couple more. Um, mylar is metallic thread, uh, generally in gold and silver, although um, or other metallic colors, although it has expanded more in more recent years. The image on the right is a gold mylar patch. Sometimes a scan or a photo will wash the color out a little bit, but is much more a metallic look. On the left is a round, um, I'm not sure how well it displays on the screen, but this is actually a twill patch where it's not fully embroidered and the base material of the patch shows through. If you can see the faint lines that go from the lower left to upper right, uh, this would be an example of a twill right patch. Um, TMR can probably be collecting, can probably bro be broken up into three very broad areas. Um, uh, as Michael said, the land was acquired in 1927. 
and campers started in 1928, although not every every borough opened camps uh, that year, but they were quickly added over the next few years. So from 1928 to approximately 1938, uh, most of the issues were at the borough level, and the vast majority of them were earned awards where a scout would complete certain activities or requirements in order to um, earn the particular badge. Um, so here are a couple from Camp Brooklyn. Uh, the B with the canoe and TP uh, is has moved moved over from Kanawaki Lakes, where uh, at Bear Mountain, where New York City Scouts uh, came before that uh, came before TMR was. Uh, uh, was purchased and used as a camping area. The colors changed uh, with the move to TMR. Uh, if, as you can see on the right, the uh, they talk about major and minor museum patches. Um, most, if not all, of the borough camps used some variation of these patches. They did change a little bit over time, but the museum that they're referring to is what today we would call the Nature Lodge, and. Um, you earn these by completing certain nature-related requirements, uh, uh, collections of leaves or plants or uh, animals, minerals, whatever it might be, and uh, that's how you would earn the museum awards. The Bronx, uh, here are a few examples uh, from the Bronx camp, Camp Ranaqua. Uh, the, the arrowheads with the two and the four, uh, you could earn those a second-year camper, fourth-year camper, we know the numbers exist from one to nine. The RAA, the fish in the middle, uh, may actually be from Kanawaki Lakes, um, where the you know the Bronx program started before it transitioned to TMR. Uh, here's some from Manhattan. Uh, the one on the left is their honor camper. Uh, so this was another earned award, um, and you can see the the very general level of requirements in the middle of the uh, page. On the right are two uh, year patches, 1935 and 1936. So, uh, you know, these aren't seen all that often, and they are some of the more difficult items to uh, to collect from uh, from Ten Mile River. Queens, uh, the main camp was Camp Man. Um, the two items here are not to scale. They're actually probably about 12 to 15 inches tall, looking like a um, like a, a skin, an animal skin. Uh, the 43 Honor Camp and 48 Honor Troop uh, were awards that could be earned in the camp. The middle one is is a patch, uh, but it has that same general animal hide-like shape and the CM for Camp Man. Uh, here's a few, not to leave out Staten Island, Camp Aquahanga. Uh, the patch on the extreme right is a uh, an aquatics award at Camp Aquahanga. We don't know the specific requirements for it. If anybody has information on any of these early felts, uh, uh, pictures of them, samples that aren't currently appearing on the museum website or any paper dealing with the awards, the museum would love to uh, to see those and be able to get scans of, of the paper or, or patches. So we at least know what's available and what the requirements were. Uh, in 1938, I would call this the second phase of, of TMR in, in general terms. Uh, Al Nichols became director of Ten Mile River, and instead of borough level awards, there became a standard reservation wide program called TMR Scout Award. And this replaced the individual borough awards and recognition programs. Uh, these patches were in use for 30 plus years into the early 1970s. Uh, probably the longest lived uh, program that, that TMR has had uh, over that time. Uh, and there were four areas, aquatics, nature, craftsmanship, which we would call uh, handicraft today, and uh, hiking. And the scout could earn, would have a requirements book uh, called the 10 Mile River Scout Symbol of Good Citizenship, where he would mark off requirements and then could earn a badge uh, in the specific area. The base patch was about, I don't have pictured here, but was about two and a half inches with the, the round, but it would just be that center section you see on the green bordered patch. The green border on the left would be someone who had completed a single 
uh, area of expertise, a basic area, uh, you know, naturalist for nature. The one on the right shows someone who had completed three uh, segments or, or three areas, in this case, um, uh, aquatics, craftsmanship, and hiking. Uh, so the full set, when you add up all the different potential color combinations, including the basic patch and a staff patch, uh, there are 17 items in this set also pretty difficult to complete in its entirety. And here's a breakdown of what uh, exists. On this uh, page, you'll see the patches all have a twill background. This started in the very late 1940s or early 1950s. You know, accounts have varied on the actual cutover date, and it's likely that uh, both existed for some time as, uh, you know, older supplies were used up since the scout is thrifty. Uh, on the bottom uh, illustration, the four color uh, version, you'll also see a metal bar with four stars on it. That was for people who earned the advanced uh, classification in, in each category, aquatics, uh, nature, uh, handicraft, and, um, and scout craft. So, you know, this was somebody who probably spent a lot of time up at TMR back in those days and uh, earned not only the basic borders, but uh, the advanced borders. You'll also see bars that have uh, only one, two, or three stars um, uh, potentially, you know, you know, that can be held in that. Uh, some of these uh, may exist. Um, you might have a patch that's uh, red and blue, indicating um, uh, red and blue. That would be hiking and, uh, and aquatics, uh, but whether or not they're, red on top, blue on the bottom, or red left and blue right. Uh, we don't really count those as part of the set. They're certainly interesting to acquire, but we're just looking for the basic uh, color combinations. Over a 30 odd year period, uh, these items would be reordered uh, any number of times and could come back a little bit different in each order. Um, another area potentially to collect would be anniversary issues. Um, the first anniversary issue was the 25th in 1952. Uh, there were a neckerchief and pocket patch. I don't have them pictured on, on these slides, but um, uh, that's the first anniversary. And uh, 1957, 1967, and then every five years after, uh, something has been issued for each anniversary. So here's a few examples of two. Uh, the leftmost and middle are jacket patches, uh, you know, larger patches. The one on the right is a pocket patch from the 80th anniversary in 2007. And here's a few more examples. Um, um, uh, again, one on the left is a jacket patch. The other two are pocket patches. Uh, on the right is the 90th anniversary uh, staff patch from just a few years ago. So you could make a significant collection of TMR items just getting everything that was issued for uh, for each anniversary. The, from 1949 till 1961 would be the main era of individual camp staff neckerchiefs uh, at TMR, and I've shown a few here on the page um, uh, from the various camps. Some of them have patches, some of them have, uh, some of them are silk screened, um, the one in the bottom right, Stillwater Staff, is from 1960. Uh, a very similar, well, the same patches were used in 1961, but they were on a different cloth, um, more of a gray tartan as opposed to as opposed to a green tartan like this one. That was the last year where each camp had an individual camp staff neckerchief. After that, for a number of years, there were individual. There was a reservation-wide staff neckerchief. Uh, and then we, although I don't have any in this presentation, we then probably get more into the era of the slide farm uh, uh, staff neckerchief slides or bolos. Um, Indian cliffs, um, we're all familiar with uh, uh, patches and neckerchiefs with these logos. Uh, it's been used since circa 1965, and this would be another area to collect. Again, the two patches on the left are jacket patches, the one on the right is a smaller oval shaped pocket patch. Um, and, you know, there were neckerchiefs, whether they're silk screened or embroidered, and, you know, other patches issued at various times. 
including the one in the middle bottom, uh, which was around 1980 or 81. I'd have to look in my notes to be sure. Uh, they modified the Indian cliffs uh, to be overlooking uh, what was supposed to be the New York City skyline. And they say in, uh, imitation is the uh, sincerest form of flattery. The logo or or the view of the Indian overlooking Indian cliffs has been used by some other camps uh, around the country uh, that we've seen. Uh, here's just a few examples we've encountered. There are probably others, but um, uh, not something that anyone has ever uh, cataloged. Um, Bob Landers. Um, Nick, Bob Landers now and previously Nick Dales was a canoe livery on the Delaware River uh, located near the camps. Nick Dale was um, active uh, in GNYC in the Brooklyn Council and worked at Rock Lake prior to starting what is now Bob Landers. Um, there is, so you'll see a lot of memorabilia issued, uh, a few patches, a lot of neckerchiefs that say 10 Mile River. Uh, but don't say 10 Mile River Scout Camps or Scout Reservation. Uh, these are examples of some of the uh, neckerchiefs that were produced by uh, by Bob Landers and sold through the canoe livery. And while it's a smaller number, and one of these looks like it's not wasn't folded properly, but um, during the 1950s and in the 1960s, uh, most troops went for a two week program and a hike to the main trading post was always a highlight uh, of a scout's time at TMR. Uh, the main trading post, in addition to what we would see in the local trading post today, the camp trading post, sold a lot of uh, souvenir uh, items and uh, uh, that weren't available in the individual camps. So if you wanted to buy something for mom, uh, a scarf, uh, uh, rather than a neckerchief might be appropriate. I'm not sure how many of these were actually worn uh, by the proud mother, but uh, these fringed um, uh, neckerchiefs uh, have no hem or border on them. Um, uh, typically were uh, woman scarves. They have the same basic design as uh, the equivalent uh, neckerchief uh, that was issued, although usually in white or a lighter color. Uh, than what the original neckerchief may have been. Uh, the third general area for camp, I would say started around 1975, or memorabilia issuance. Prior to that, it was very rare that an individual camp had um, any sort of, aside from the staff neckerchiefs, any sort of memorabilia that was just specific for Camp Aquahanga, as you can see on the screen here, or any of the other individual camps. They were 10 Mile River memorabilia, but not camp memorabilia. But circa 1975, uh, they began issuing items for the individual camps. And here we see a, a handful of different items um, used by Camp Aquahunga over the years. And you can see um, on the upper right and lower middle, uh, they reused the design um, uh, from their 40th anniversary, modified it for the 50th. So uh, some uh, ideas got recycled, and you can also potentially see, uh, you know, how totems may have changed uh, over the years, or what, or a decision was made not to use them uh, for some particular reason some year. You know, the birch bark A for Aquahanga uh, only appears on some of these patches, not all of them. Uh, Kiowa has also had its share of. Uh, uh, patches, whether it's for a special event at camp like the polar bear swim, a staff patch, or a generic camper patch. Uh, and as you can see, most of these have uh, some version of the Kiowa Thunderbird uh, on them. Uh, Ranaqua <coughs> is a little bit different um, uh, since for a good part of its history, it was uh, leased, uh, or a good part of its modern history at least, was leased by Hudson Delaware Council, uh, then Hudson Valley Council. So uh, this is another interesting area that people can collect where they could just collect uh, the Hudson Delaware issues for Camp Ranaqua or Camp Hayden for that matter, uh, which was leased by Rockland County. But here are a few examples from uh, uh, Camp Ranaqua. The lower one was uh, an award that you could earn at camp, uh, the lower middle. 
and the polar bear. Camp Ranaquai traditionally has had a polar bear patch, uh, certainly for most of the last 20 odd years. Uh, that's a very quick overview of, of 10 mile river collecting. Like I say, there are, if you just want to think about it one way, they started issuing camp patches in 1975 or so. So for 45 plus years, there have been one, probably one or two issues from each open camp for each year, you know, that they were there. So just in that amount of time, there are, you know, a couple of hundred uh, issues between Ranaqua, Kiowa, Aquahanga and Kernikin and Kunata for some portions of those time, let alone going back uh, further in time or all the generic uh, TM more modern TMR issues that have been uh, presented. Um, moving into New York City OA, uh, just a very brief history. And again, this is a very high level overview. We could spend a significant amount of time on each uh, individual lodge and uh, certainly go into a lot greater depth on the various items that TMR has issued. Uh, but New York City and TMR have had a very long history of supporting the Order of the Arrow. Ranaqua Lodge was formed over 100 years ago in 1920. Uh, within the next decade or so, uh, the other lodges, Shishuga, Swanakee, Manhattan, and Aquahangian, were all chartered. Uh, primarily uh, in the early days, in the 19, early 50, or prior to the 1950s, uh, Order of the Arrow was primarily a summer camp activity with minimal uh, things done in the city. Um, uh, that changed in the 50s when uh, things were moved more on to uh, organizing the chapters of the lodges or, or the lodges themselves more along the district boundaries. Uh, and in 2013, in April of 2013, the five uh, original lodges were merged to form Kintakoying Lodge, um, which is the single lodge for uh, Greater New York Councils today. So Camp, Ra so Camp Ranaqua, also the name for Ranaqua Lodge, um, has issued a number of different pieces of memorabilia over the years. And again, a very small sample here uh, they've issued event patches, one for their final banquet in 2013, a sample of the 40th anniversary, uh, one of their 40th anniversary neckerchiefs, um, uh, a NOAC issue from uh, 2012. You'll note uh, they all pretty much have the Al Totem of Ranaqua Lodge. On the lower left uh, uh, is a chapter issue from uh, Ranaqua Lodge. Uh, don't see these too often. Um, they would certainly be uh, of interest to uh, most OA collectors or most New York City OA collectors. Um, and earlier event patches from Ranaqua Lodge aren't well documented. So if anyone has any photos or information on any chapter or event issues from Ranaqua Lodge, particularly going back to the 50s, we would certainly appreciate it. And when you're collecting, sometimes people get into uh, minutia. Uh, you'll see in this center, uh, bottom center here, uh, two very similar looking issues, but some of the background colors have been uh, changed a little bit. And uh, OA collectors tend to uh, seek out these varieties, although not every collector. Uh, the bottommost one was issued for NOAC. The version above it, which used a similar design, although a slightly different uh, uh, background color, is, um, uh, was their regular lodge issue for the time. Uh, Shishuga had a very strong uh, chapter system and issued a large number of event patches. Uh, on the left and right top row are two samples of uh, event patches from Shishuga Lodge. Um, uh, on the bottom left is a, neck, a metal neckerchief slide from 1940, probably one of the earliest um, uh, pieces of memorabilia from the lodge, aside from, I believe, a couple of felt chapter issues uh, that have been uncovered. The bottom center is a, a pin that was used by the Order of the Arrow, produced by a jeweler Caldwell, I believe out of Philadelphia, who... Um, issued these uh, totem pins for many of the lodges. Uh, they were fairly expensive uh, in uh, monetary terms, at least in that, in that era. 
uh, and they are highly collectible. Uh, and this one is the blue heron from uh, from Shishuga. And on the bottom right is another chapter issue, a neckerchief from Katoki chapter. Again, th there are hundreds of issues between chapter events and other patches from uh, Shishuga. So this is only a, a very small sample of uh, of what would be out there or potential areas to collect. Again, Swanakee, the Lodge from Queens, uh, their final or what's sometimes colloquially termed the death flap, uh, their deer totem getting roasted over a fire. Uh, on the left is something you don't see too often, but uh, this was a flap issued by Swanakee Lodge uh, to tell Tiak Lodge uh, 404 after Hurricane Katrina when there was significant damage to their camp. Uh, so this was issued as a fundraiser sold by uh, Sw the Swanakee brothers and then used to uh, help support the um, uh, the rebuilding of uh, you know part of the areas of Camp Tiaxa Lodge in Louisiana. The bottom two neckerchiefs are chapter neckerchiefs from uh, from Queens, uh, um, probably from the 1950s or early 1960s. Um, again, Queens had an extensive chapter system, um, and uh, each chapter or many of the chapters produced their own memorabilia in, in addition to what was produced by the lodge. In the center is a, a somewhat more, well, to me is the modern piece, but probably from the 1980s, uh, a leather round uh, issued by Swanakee Lodge, I believe uh, during one of the area conclaves they hosted. And on the top right is a ceremonial patch uh, uh, that could be earned by uh, people who perform ceremonies in, uh, uh, you know, for Swanakee Lodge, whether it was ordeal, brotherhood or vigil. There were various watercolors issued for this. Uh, Manhattan also has issued uh, a significant amount of memorabilia over the years. On the top left is an event neckerchief from an event they hosted back in 1956, Arrow Although they don't have the volume of Swanakee or Shishuga, uh, there was also some chapter issues uh, from Manhattan Lodge as well. Here's one from, and I may be mispronouncing it, but Powhatan chapter. Again, probably don't see this all that often. Uh, the bottom flap that's pictured there with the big apple is the final flap that was issued um, uh, by Manhattan Lodge. It was their regular issue, which had been in use. And they, have, they did produce, uh, as they were exiting uh, as part of the merger into Kintacoying, they issued that small arrowhead on the bottom right, uh, 1936 to 2013. Uh, their years of existence, um, uh, and that was the general pattern of that patch is what was their first arrowhead-shaped patch. On the bottom left is a camporee that the lodge uh, supported um, uh, back in 2003, and that exists in various border colors. Which brings us here to Aquahangian Lodge, um, the lodge for Staten Island. Aquahangian did not use the chapter system and had very few event issues, so it's more uh, primarily patches and neckerchiefs. On the top right is a neckerchief slide, I believe from the slide farm, uh, produced by Roland Flora and used by the lodge. Uh, the middle patch on the, the top middle, it was issued at their last banquet, it was a very limited release from what I understand uh, to uh, the principal uh, officers in the lodge at, at the time when it was being merged. Uh, the top left is their round patch, which was probably one of the first patches, if not the first patch uh, issued by the lodge and one on a, uh, a neckerchief. Uh, we've also heard um, uh, that this could also potentially have been the 1949 Camp Aquahanga uh, staff neckerchief because they uh, got to the party a little bit late and hadn't uh, issued a, um, a staff neckerchief as many of the other camps had started doing by that time. Uh, and then we get to Kim uh Coming up, or I guess just over uh, eight years old now, uh, Kim Tukoying has also issued a number of uh, items over the years. Uh, the top left, something a little bit different, was a uh, holiday ornament issued for uh, 
uh, an Indian or a Native American seminar uh, that Kinsakoin used to host, uh, you know, with their falcon uh, totem displayed. Uh, the center patch is the chenille, which looks sort of like a high school letter or, or, or a rug, uh, s sort of like a rug. It's a raised uh, surface. Gen used to be more handmade uh, than currently, but that displays the centennial logo of the Order of the Arrow from 2015, a fifth anniversary arrowhead, and then some two-piece sets uh, uh, that the Lodge has uh, issued, two for NOAX, uh, one showing uh, the New York City taxi, uh, the, the more recent NOAC uh, in 2018, or the last one that was actually held uh, prior to COVID, and the middle one was issued by the Lodge as part of the 90th anniversary celebration for 10 Mile River. So again, very high level, very quick uh, view of, uh, of New York City uh, order of the arrow issues. Uh, there are probably close between all six lodges now, probably close to, if you wanted one of everything, there are probably close to a thousand pieces to collect uh, across those lodges. And we could spend a significant amount of time just going through uh, each individual lodge and what they had to offer um, you know, as well. I'm not sure if we have the demand for that, but we can certainly entertain uh, more in-depth dives uh, if, if people are interested. So where can you find it? Where can you get it? Uh, how can, you know, I figure out where to learn more? Uh, how can I find things uh, for my collection? So Mike has mentioned uh, the museum on the uh, where we have a number of items for sale. Uh, if the museum does open this summer and you have the uh, uh, the ability to visit the museum, the museum store also has a <clears throat> a number of older uh, items uh, available that people have donated and we sell to help finance the uh, museum program and our ongoing operations. eBay, um, uh, the online marketplace, uh, has over 447,000 Boy Scout items listed. Not all unique. But um, earlier today, when I looked, they had over 447,000 items issued or listed, uh, not issued, listed uh, for sale or for auction on the site. Uh, they have search functions which will allow you to uh, limit that search down to a much more limited uh, uh, scope. If you search TMR or 10 Mile River, uh, when I did the search, I came up with 431. Uh, items currently being offered for sale from uh, TMR or produced by TMR and for sale by certain individuals who have acquired them over the years. Um, uh, one other thing I'll say just as far as eBay and even you know anybody looking to purchase memorabilia, there is no true price guide. Uh, it's pretty much what the market will bear. Um, you know, let the buyer beware, uh, if you will. Uh, one particular patch, the generic uh, uh, TMR Indian overlooking Indian cliffs with a gold border, which was produced uh, probably around uh, or began being produced around 1965. There are more than a dozen of those currently for sale on eBay or for auction on eBay at prices from below $5 to nearly $30. Uh, and the $30 example, $29.99 example, is actually probably in the worst condition of all of them. So uh, just jumping on the first uh, item you see may not be the best idea. You know, look, learn, search uh, closed items, sold items, see what an item uh, may be worth if you're considering purchasing something. Uh, Kintico Shishuga Lodge and then Kintakoyan Lodge has been hosting a trade array and the 25th Tradery uh, will actually be held this year uh, a little bit earlier than normal on Saturday, October 9th. It'll be part of the Big Apple Jamboree, part of their pro overall program, but will be hosted by Kintakoying Lodge. I will be the advisor to the event with one of my other hats. Uh, the Tradery will run uh, from 9 a.m. in the morning till around 3 p.m. in the afternoon. It will be held in... Uh, uh, the activity center at Alpine, which uh, uh, for someone my age is Orbach Arena, uh, but all the signs say activity center these days. 
So we'll be there. Uh, that's probably about 40 uh, eight foot tables of uh, scouting memorabilia of various types and age and from uh, virtually all areas of the country. Uh, traders uh, or, or collectors of memorabilia will rent tables from the lodge and, and lay out what they have available. And uh, you can purchase items and trade items and potentially sell items to some of those uh, some of those vendors. So if you are interested in uh, either just seeing a little bit more of what is out there, uh, holding some of that cloth in your hand, certainly consider putting that on the calendar. We'll have more information as uh, as time goes forward. If you're into social media, Facebook in particular has a number of different scout patch collecting trading buy and sell groups the step the biggest is probably scout patch collectors uh, which has over 17,000 members currently not all active every day uh, but you can certainly uh, look to those for um, uh, to see things that are being made being offered um, and, and and help you decide what you want to collect and then you can always talk to you know members of your troop friends relatives other folk you may know who either are currently in scouting or may have been in scouting years ago, uh, just to see what they may have, uh, even if it's just to learn a little more of the history. One of the nice things about collecting is aside from uh, the actual piece of cloth in your hands, is also earning a bit of the, learning a bit of the history behind what that item was. And I maintain two websites, one on 10 Mile River Collecting and one on New York State OA. If anyone has any interest, I put the links. The links are down here at the bottom. Um, you know, if if there's a question you think of after the event and uh, uh, you want to ask me, you can always uh, put a comment there or uh, you know on the YouTube channel, uh, and we'll certainly try to get to them. Um, as I said, if there's any further interest, we can potentially look at doing future talks on. Um, Sorry about that. We can look for uh, future talks, uh, which can concentrate on specific items or uh, other areas of preserving or displaying collections or, or whatever the demand might be. I hope you enjoyed the overall talk. I'm not sure if we have any questions yet. Hey, Bill. Um, hi, everybody. This is Mitchell Sleppy, and I'm the museum's vice chair and one of the webinar coordinators. Thank you very much for an amazing presentation. We have a bunch of questions, and I also want to mention that we have with us, who will help answer some of the questions, our Chairman Emeritus and our founder, Dr. Jean Berman. So let's jump on. Um, what are considered to be TMR's most valuable patches? Uh, I would say probably the felts from the Borough Camp era from the late 1920s to the late 1930s. Uh, just the fact that they're, um, you know, 80, in some cases, 90 years old. Uh, uh, you know, they weren't issued in uh, the greatest quantities. A number of them had to be earned rather than uh, uh, just bought at the trading post. Uh, so I, I would say those are probably the ones in most uh, the hardest to find, um, there's um, the demand isn't necessarily that high, so they might not be as expensive as you might think, because the collecting pool is somewhat shallow. And one thing I didn't mention during the presentation, but as part of the education process, you should learn uh, uh, how. Unfortunately, there we have encountered a few felts that have been. Uh, faked or reproduced uh, current versions to replicate the old uh, old patches, which is fine if you're paying a small amount of money for it to use as a placeholder, but not if you're paying a premium price for it. Can I jump in for a second, Mitch? Yeah, go ahead, Gene. Yeah, no, I was just going to say also to add to what Bill said, that uh, aside from the, which I agree with, that the early felts are probably the most valuable patches some of them selling for several hundred dollars actually uh but also probably after that the next uh, category would probably be the staff neckerchiefs which are a very popular collection because uh, you've got almost 200 different 
staff neckerchiefs that can be collected and they carry in a pretty good premium also probably most of them around 35 to 100 dollars depending on what they are just wanted to add that yeah Thank and you, adding Gene. on point there the demand pool on the staff neckerchiefs can be a little bit deeper even than on some of the felts because her camp patch collectors uh some of those staff patches may be the only item from uh, from that particular camp you know uh, camp chapagat or, or or Camp Ipatanga didn't issue a, a standard patch for um, uh, for campers. So if somebody wants to represent uh, Camp Ipatanga in their collection, they would need to acquire one of the neckerchiefs that had a patch uh, for it. Great. Um, thank you so much, gentlemen. Oh, some of the questions are similar, so they will be answered. I'm just going to sort of combine them if there's a word or two difference. So let's keep jumping in. Uh, how did TMR decide to use the image of the Native American Indian to represent the camp, or stereotypical, stereotyped image of the Native American? Well, one thing we have at the museum, um, the, the region uh, where Ten Mile River is located was actually uh, settled by the Lenni Lenape Indian tribe, and there have been a couple of archaeological archeolo digs done on the reservation, which showed, um, uh, uh, you know, the presence and some artifacts uh, that, that were located in a couple of the sites that have been explored uh, by archaeologists over the years, some of which, uh, to flood the museum, are, uh, are on display there. So uh, not knowing what the individual thought process of some of the um, folk 50 or plus years ago might be, uh, I would suspect it was at least in part to honor the uh, the early Native Americans who lived on the land. Great, thank you. Um, next question: Did the BSA introduce any patches or the camp to recognize girls being introduced to the program? I'm not aware of anything TMR specifically has done. Uh, remember, though, that the, the timing of that was pretty much during the COVID year. Uh, TMR, 10 Mile River, uh, issues patches primarily for the summer camp season. And since the 2020 summer camp season did not happen, um, um, except uh, on the web, I'm only aware of one patch that was issued uh, for participating in the uh, in the Internet camp program, if you will, since the overnight camp could not be open based on the uh, uh, the New York State Health Department regulations. Sounds good. Gene, anything that you're aware of? No, no, I'm not aware that they would specifically put out a patch because TMR campers has always been the philosophy are TMR campers and I would imagine now with girls being TMR campers and boys being TMR campers they're all TMR campers I don't know that they would want to separate or segregate that group but I can't talk authoritatively I really do not know great um thanks guys um next question and we have a couple more questions and then I'm going to turn it over to Michael and there's actually a question I'm going to pose to Michael at the end because I think it's more directed to him um okay um what does NOAC stand for? Because I know you talked about it a little bit during the presentation. Sorry, you get uh, too used to the acronyms. NOAC is National Order of the Arrow Conference. It's typically held every two or three years. Um, as the first word says, a national event where members of the Order of the Arrow from all over the country uh, get together for training fellowship and uh, maybe a little patch trading uh, as well. Um, uh, the next one is scheduled for 2022. It's going to be held at the University of Tennessee in Nashville. Great. Um, should be fun. I know a lot of people, including family, who have attended these events. Uh, with the Redskins name falling from grace, is the dark-skinned Indian found to be objectionable by anybody? Nobody has directed anything to me. I don't know if uh, if anyone else, uh, you know, whether it's uh, Michael or Gene and his, uh, as Chairman Emeritus or uh, Michael as the current chairman has received any comments on that. 
Um, I'm not aware of anything personally. Uh, let me just add that maybe as far back as 20 years ago, uh, our original totem was a profile brave with war paint. And at that time, uh, there were comments about that and the museum voted and agreed to remove the war paint from the brave. But as far as modern uh, issues, uh, I've heard nothing as far as 10 Mile River, but I imagine that 10 Mile River and Greater New York Councils are gonna follow the lead of the National Council on Policy. Perfect. Um, there's a one comment here. Um, I think you said Nashville for the NOAC and somebody wrote in Knoxville, so we could just check yes, that out. I'm and maybe sorry. Look. I'm not, not as good with my uh, Tennessee cities yet, but yes, Knoxville. Okay, cool. Um, okay. Uh, Next question. Could the patch that you call Camp Man actually be a clonus seat in? I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, Gene. Jump in. Cloisonet, cloisonet, a cloisonet pin. Uh, I am not aware of any Camp Man actual patch in that shape. Could be, but I've never seen or heard of one. But it exactly matches uh, a cloisonet pin that I have. So that question is really to Bill, whether uh, if he was able to come up with that to see if that's possible, that that might actually be a pin and not a patch. Um, I had acquired that image. I don't have the underlying uh, uh, patch or pin, whatever it may be. Uh, but, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see if we can get a better, see if we can find the source of that image and uh, uh, get a little information on that. And that's part of the reason. Uh, just to plug the memorabilia guide again, we, we talk about updating it. It's so we can uh, have people tell us we're wrong or we're right or how come you didn't include, and uh, that will improve the knowledge base that we have for the museum. Uh, there is no, there was no checklist that survived at least of what was issued, whether it was Camp Man or one of the other camps uh, in the 1930s. You know that that hasn't survived, or we haven't discovered it yet. So uh, uh, doing these talks, um, uh, presenting information at the museum, uh, uh, producing collecting guides, that's all just some of the ways we you know, utilize to try and uh, increase our knowledge base and to learn more about our own history at the camp. Great, thank you, Bill. Uh, one or two more questions, then we'll wrap it up. And if you think of any other questions in the next couple of days, feel free to email us and we'll do our best to get back to you with answers. Uh, so next question, um, coming to the tradery this year for the younger scouts, what is the best thing for them to do, the teenage scouts that are just starting collecting when they go to the tables and talk to some of the patch traders in terms of staying within a teen budget and not really getting ripped off, but getting something quality as they're beginning their collections and kind of deciding which way they want to go, if it's going to be well, camp patches or eight patches, et cetera. Yeah, I'll take a quick stab at that and then maybe Gene can pick up anything uh, I've missed. I would say one, don't buy something at the first table you get to um, unless you know the true value of the item. Uh, you may find it two tables further in uh, for a, a lower price. I, I would also, again, unless you know the value of something, if you're trading, look to trade more one for one. Here's my patch. I'll, I'd like to trade it for one of yours of comparable uh, of, of comparable worth, whether it's an OA flap or a cam patch for cam patch or whatever it might be. Um, you'll find most people accommodating, but some people may only be looking to sell what they've acquired, uh, you know, because they're further down the trail and not looking to accumulate any more, uh, any more items. All right, and uh, I'll, what I'll add to that, I agree with what Bill said as to number one, uh, don't be in a rush to buy something immediately until you've had a chance to look. So my first advice to the new traders, whatever age you might be, is look, look look listen and learn because once you get an idea as bill mentioned earlier in the presentation there were there are thousands and thousands of different 
patches in hundreds of different categories in scouting. So it is impossible for one person to collect everything. And that person who tries to collect everything winds up getting frustrated and collecting nothing. So whether you're going to collect Order of the Arrow, whether you're going to collect council shoulder patches or jamborees uh, or a million other possibilities of things that you may want to collect, take your time to make your decision as to what you want to collect. Do your best to stay within the lane of that particular collecting item primarily. And uh, as I said, uh, don't let the uh, people uh, tell you how valuable their patch is and they have you have to give them three of yours to get one of theirs in most cases it just ain't so great um thank you both gene and of course bill for running tonight's talk um on collecting tmr and new york city oa patches really interesting hopefully we do some more patch training webinars in the future i'm going to turn it over to michael to wrap it up and before i do the question uh, I think is most best to be directed at him is, do we know if the museum will open this summer? And the answer is, I don't know. <laughs> um, that, that'll be up to uh, Greater New York Council. And I do know that Greater New York Council is still waiting for guidance from the State Health Department. Um, so all I can say is we hope that the museum we hope that the museum will be open in some form this summer, um, and we're hoping that we will know for sure before the end of May. That's the best I could say, Mitchell. Thank you, sir. Sure. And I want to thank again. Um, our Chairman Emeritus, Gene Berman, for jumping in for, to the question and answer. And a very special thank you to our trustee and chairman of the Museum's Memorabilia Committee, Bill Mulrennan, for his sharing his knowledge and his passion of patches with us. I found it a great program. I hope the rest of you did as well. And our next webinar will be on May 27th. You can, um, I, I am really excited about it because I'm going to be the presenter and I'm going to get, talk about the history of Rock Lake. So if you are a, uh, an alum of one of the Brooklyn camps or, um, or Camp Kunita, um, please tell others and uh, you can register for that webinar at tmrmuseum.org slash webinars. As I said, uh, you can take a tour, a virtual tour of the museum uh, at tmrmuseum.org slash historian. And for scouts, we are still offering the 2020 Museum Historian Patch for scouts who take the virtual tour and answer a few questions at the end of that tour. More information on the website. For uh, the rest of you who are viewers, and if you want to start your patch collection or add to your patch collection, the museum is offering for sale this six inch back patch commemorating the uh, 2020 summer season. Uh, with the no COVID uh, symbol and the motto, we are all in this together. So you can order, uh, order that patch at the, uh, on the museum store on the museum website. Also on the website, you can get information about the Ten Mile River Historic Trail and the Historic Trail medal and patch that you can earn uh, for completing the trail. Again, if you found this uh, talk interesting and you enjoyed it and you want to support talks like this in the future, I certainly invite you to visit the museum's um, donation page and uh, make an appropriate donation. We'll greatly appreciate that. 
Otherwise, here are the different ways that you can interact with the museum online, uh, our website, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube channel. And that's it for our program for this week. I hope you'll join us, I guess, two or three weeks on the 27th. And otherwise, have a great night. Thank you.